Good evening, Internet. How are we doing? Um, I'm coming to you from my front porch because it is incredible out here today. I hope you have had an opportunity to get out and get a little bit of vitamin D, vitamin E, I, sunshine. I hope you've had a lot of chance to uh, grab some fresh air. It is, um, it's just incredible out here. So I'm looking forward to uh, hanging out here and catching up with Pastor Raymond, who is bringing us our final Holy Week devotion of the week. We started off on Monday um, talking about God's love. Pastor Dave helped us to understand that better than last night. Pastor Glenn talked to us about our sin and the ugliness that that is. And so today we are continuing in that journey to speak of specifically the sacrifice of Jesus. And tonight, Pastor Raymond, who has been leading worship and music ministry here in the Maryland area for over 30 years, will uh, give us an opportunity um, to center in on and understand better the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and for the entire world because of his love and because of our sin, Christ's sacrifice, which is the culmination of both of, of the topics from last night and the night prior. Um, but before I hand it over to Pastor Raymond, I, I want to make sure we have the roadmap ahead. Tomorrow is a huge, huge evening of worship, a worship concert that we are um, casting in and streaming into all of your homes and all of your screens. We want you to invite family and friends virtually and uh, send out the link to them and uh, give them an invite so that we could all just just center in, in on some great music and sing along and enjoy an evening of worship. Tomorrow night, we are, uh, we're, we're going to encapsulate the entire Passion story from cross all the way to the empty grave. So it's not just going to be like a Good Friday, and it's not just going to be like an Easter Sunday. It's going to be the entire story all encapsulated into one. And so we're hoping that you will join us tomorrow night at 645 as we uh, engage in this night of worship. But I, I want to give you a, a heads up a little bit on the inside of that. Um, I've mentioned it before, and it's on the virtualeaster.com website, but uh, go ahead and make plans now. We are going to take communion tomorrow night. We're, we're going to come and partake in the Lord's Supper. And so whatever you have in your house, anything, like if you have anything bread-like or anything juice-like, even if you have a can of Coke or water from the tap, whatever, uh, grab something so that you and I would be able to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, remember his death on the cross. We had kicked around some ideas about how to do this in our new situation with COVID-19, and we had um, you know, we had talked about maybe mailing out that little like communion in a cup that's all encapsulated, mailing that out to everybody in our church family. Um, we had talked about even having like a drive through, like the pastors and deacons there at the church have a drive through where you pick up the elements and take it home and then be ready for the worship concert on Thursday night. And uh, basically all of those ideas uh, really um, made us think that we were putting our emphasis in the wrong spot because it, it, it doesn't matter if you partake in communion if it comes directly from the church or from a pastor or from a deacon it doesn't matter if it's uh, actual bread or actual like a juice or wine or anything it doesn't matter any of that stuff because it's not the element that is mystical it's not the element that is magical it is the remembrance of what he has done for us and remembering his sacrifice and at the end of the day the bread and the cup are just vehicles for us to be able to have this kind of tangible extra sense, if you will, as we remember his sacrifice. And so tomorrow night, we're going to remember his body broken and his blood shed in whatever way and in whatever element that you have around the house, we're going to do so tomorrow night. And so we hope that you would tune in with us then as we just broadcast the hope of the cross and the empty tomb that Christ brings. And, and then on Good Friday, uh, to remind you, we are not broadcasting. We're not going live with anything. We are kind of using Friday as a day of, of, of just, I don't know, a day of silence even, just a, a day of meditation and a day of prayer. Uh, no broadcast. We do have a devotional that we put in a PDF there on virtualeaster.com on the website. We hope that you might download it. You might um, get your family and your spouse and you know everybody together in the room, and you might be able to go through those portions of Scripture 
so that we could see the prophecy of Christ at the cross and then Christ at the cross. And I'm getting an email at the same time, but uh, the prophecy of Christ and all of that that happens through the scripture. So do that tomorrow and just allow tomorrow to be a day of reflection and really a day of silence. And then Saturday, we're going to take a day off. Sunday is the celebration of all celebrations. Even though this year our celebration is going to be virtual, we are still celebrating the realest thing that has ever happened in our world. Though our celebration will be virtual, we will be celebrating reality. And so we want you to invite everybody you know near and wide. This is going to be the easiest Easter to invite family and friends to virtualeaster.com as we celebrate the reality of Christ at the cross and most importantly Sunday, the resurrection, which gives everyone hope, especially in these dark, chaotic <laughs> times. Dog, stop. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to Pastor Raymond so that he can talk to us about the sacrifice of Christ tonight as we finish off our devotions, and then we'll see you tomorrow night, 645. Pastor Raymond, take it away. Hello, Faith family. Anyone else who may have snuck in, uh, thank you for joining us again tonight. Um, we miss your smiling face around here and, uh, and just look forward to getting back together. But in the meantime, we're trying to stay connected as best we can. And we thank you for being a part of this and hope you'll continue to do that this week. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk some about the crucifixion. And so uh, just to let you know that some of my comments midway are, are a little graphic. And so for, uh, for uh, some of the younger children who you think may not be ready for that, uh, we understand. Just wanted you to know that. I want to begin by showing you a picture I know that you probably can't see this all that well, and that's okay. Uh, this is not a great work of art. <laughs> it's a simple picture of a stone church with some trees around it. The church is actually probably leaning a little bit to the left. Um, many people would look at this and say that the frame and the matting are worth more than the, than the picture itself. Um, that's all right. I understand. But the picture uh, hangs proudly in my living room. To me, it's of great value because it was painted by my 93-year-old mother. Um, more than just the sentimental value, I, I treasure this painting because I know the love and hard work that went into it. My mother labored over each detail as best she could with her aged hands, and she poured not just her talent, but her, but her heart into this painting. This work is priceless to me because I understand the loving sacrifice that went into the finished product. This coming Sunday, people around the world will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We will rejoice in the bedrock of our faith. The empty tomb means that Jesus has conquered death. And if there was ever a reason to celebrate, uh, this is it. And yet many, I think, will miss the overwhelming joy of Easter because in their hurry to get to the empty tomb, they will have gone past the cross. But it's the cross that gives the empty tomb its meaning. When we stand before the cross, the depth of Christ's love and sacrifice is inescapable. It becomes personal because there's no way you can look at the cross and walk away unchanged. As the hymn writer Isaac Watts composed, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? It's never a comfortable thing to survey something as tragic as the crucifixion. When we see a, a car accident, uh, there may be some that will stop and stare, but most of us will look away. We realize that there, at this point there's really nothing that we can do and we don't want to be drawn into the sadness of someone else's grief. And yet sometimes sadness can be healing. Uh, the great philosopher Charlie Brown would call it good grief. To fully celebrate Easter, the finished product, we need to understand the events that led up to and try to comprehend the sacrifice that was made. The word sacrifice comes from a Hebrew verb, which means to slaughter for an offering. In the Old Testament, the law of Moses required that a priest offer sacrifices on behalf of the worshiper by burning it on the altar. Whenever an animal could be sacrificed, the, the law clearly stated that it had to be the best, one without defect. The offering symbolically transferred the sins of the worshiper to the animal, who then became an atonement or a covering for the sin. 
But this process, this sacrifice, had to be repeated periodically because it was only temporary and it only dealt partially with the sin. The clearest picture in the Old Testament of what was to happen when Jesus came was when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac as an offering. Isaac represented the, the covenant promise that God had made with the people of Israel. But in faith, Abraham was ready to take the life of his own son until God stopped his hand and provided a substitute sacrifice, a ram. Ultimately, all of the sacrifices in the Old Testament are pointing ahead to one event in, in history, which was to provide the final, all-sufficient, spotless sacrifice. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming for the first time, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus left heaven for one reason, to become the spotless Lamb of God, to offer himself as a sacrifice. At the time of Jesus' death, crucifixion was considered the most severe form of capital punishment in the Roman Empire. It was used only for slaves and the lowest types of criminals, not for Romans. Crucifixion was one of the most painful, disgraceful, degrading punishments known to man. It was the way in which God allowed his son to be crucified. Could Jesus have been killed in a much easier manner? Absolutely. Could there be any more vivid demonstration of the extent to which Jesus has shown his love for us? Never. On Palm Sunday, just five days before the crucifixion, Jesus entered Jerusalem to the cheers of the crowd, proclaiming him as Messiah and King but he knew those cheers would be short-lived. During the week, he told his followers that he was going to die. On Thursday evening, during the Passover meal, Jesus excused Judas to go and betray him. Later, he told his disciples that all of them would, would leave him, forsake him. None of it, any of this was a surprise to him. Around uh, after supper, Jesus took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and around midnight, Judas led a contingent of soldiers and, and Jewish religious leaders to where Jesus was. He was arrested and taken to the palace of the high priest, where throughout the night, Jesus stood accused before Caiaphas, stood two trials in the Sanhedrin, all of the time being ridiculed and being beaten periodically. Mark chapter 22 tells us, that the soldiers who were guarding Jesus blindfolded him. Individual soldiers struck him numerous times and said, prophesy, tell us which one of us struck you. Early on Friday morning, around 6 a.m., Jesus was marched to the palace of Pilate. Pilate found no fault in him and sent him to the, to the palace of Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee. Herod mocked Jesus, then returned him back to Pilate. Pilate, thinking that he might uh, arouse sympathy for Jesus, commanded that he be scourged. In the process of scourging, that meant that Jesus was bent over, tied to a post, and a trained Roman soldier whipped him with several strips of, of uh, leather, at the end of which were broken bone or pieces of iron. Following that, Romans took and formed a uh, uh, crown of thorns and pushed it down on his head and then they took a robe and put it over the open flesh that had been torn away from his back and proclaimed him as king of the Jews Jesus now barely able to stand was taken back to Pilate for the last time in John chapter 19 Pilate who is still looking for a reason to release Jesus said don't you understand that I have the power to release or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, you would have no power against me at all unless it were given you from above. Jesus had willed himself to die. Immediately following, at around nine o'clock, Jesus, bearing the cross beam on his back for as long as he could, was led to the hill called Golgotha. When they arrived, Jesus was offered a mixture of wine and myrrh to help deaden or dull the senses, but Jesus refused. This is why he had left heaven, and he was going to see it to the very end. The guards then laid Jesus down on his back, 
with his neck resting on the crossbeam. One of the soldiers took his and extended his arm and taking a spike about six inches long, nailed the spike through his wrist. Now the soldier was trained not to hit the artery that would cause almost sudden death. Instead, he, hit the, he severed the median nerve, which sent shocks of pain all the way through the arm and the shoulder. And once he had nailed the other wrist in place, he bent the knees slightly, put one foot over the other, and drove a spike through both of the feet. A team of soldiers then would raise the cross beam about six feet in the air and place a pin in the vertical beam that was already in the ground. In most cases, almost immediately, the weight of the body on the cross would cause the, the shoulder sockets to pop out. The worst part of this crucifixion is that most victims die from asphyxiation. When the body hangs in the, in the V position, the pain in the wrist and the arms is beyond unbearable. Also, the pectoral muscles on the sides of the chest are paralyzed, not allowing the lungs to exhale. The only way to breathe, even momentarily, is to put the full weight of the body on the single spike sticking through the feet which cramps the legs and the thighs. Eventually, there is no more strength left to raise the body in order to breathe. Jesus moved between these two positions for almost six hours. And during that time, he spoke to his mother, entrusting her into the care of John, the disciple. He also forgave those who had mocked him and nailed him to the cross. Dr. Luke says in chapter 23 that one of the soldiers derided him saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The ironic truth is that because Jesus was the one chosen by God to save others, he could not save himself. Jesus hung on the cross for me and for you. Isaiah wrote of this day almost 800 years before, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Near the end, around 3 p.m., Jesus called out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At the darkest moment in history, from eternity past to eternity future, Jesus took on the sins of the world, and God the Father then turned his back on his only son. He did not do for himself what he did for Abraham. He allowed his son to die alone. John the Apostle tells us that Jesus, just before he breathed his last breath, said, Tetelestai, meaning it is finished. It's the word that servants would say to their masters, meaning, I have completed the work assigned for me. It's also the word written across a promissory note saying that the debt has been paid in full. It was not the cry of a defeated dying man. It was the cry of a triumphant Savior who is redeeming us. Charles Spurgeon has said that tetelestai means that Jesus crucified sin. He said, on, our champion accepted the challenge to do battle for our soul's redemption. He met sin, horrible, terrible, all but omnipotent sin nailed him to the cross. But in that deed, Christ nailed sin also to the tree. There they both hung together, sin and sin's destroyer. Sin destroyed Christ, and by that destruction, Christ destroyed sin. My prayer for each of us, is that as we celebrate Easter, the finished product, the resurrection of Christ, that we never get too far from the cross, but because it's in the cross that we find the good grief. Yes, uh, we, we grieve 
at what Christ had to endure and we fall down and, 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 and confess the sins that caused Christ to, to have to die for our sin. But yet we can also look at the cross and be washed over with the love of God, realizing that God was willing to stretch his arms and say, I love you this much. When I was a young boy, about six or seven, I remember this is what drew me to Christ, that he would love me so much even when I didn't love him. Romans 5, 8 says, Scarcely for a righteous man would some die, but Christ, while we are still sinners, died for us. The song that touched me then was called The Love of God. The second verse says, Could we with ink the ocean fill, or were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. God showed his love for us at the cross. It is simply all that we can do to simply respond in love to him. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love, that you have shown us beyond any question that you have loved us. We pray that we might respond with gratitude, we might respond with joy, we might respond with abandon. Father, help us as we prepare to celebrate the resurrection, that we never forget the price that was paid. May we never look at the cross, may we never look at communion casually and not remember, Father, how much you have loved us in Christ. Jesus, we thank you for willing to endure the shame and the suffering, but even more the separation from the Father. And we pray that as we seek, Lord, to serve you, to love you, that we would never forget the price that was paid. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Love you. God bless you.